Well, good morning, everyone. Let's stand. It's a good Sunday morning. You know why? This is the day that the Lord has made. Amen? Oh, that was weak. Are you awake? I said, this is the day that the Lord has made. Amen? All right. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. How many today are glad that you know Jesus? That you found him or he found you, right? How many are glad you're redeemed? That you know the free pardon of sin that has been forgiven? No more weight hanging on your shoulders. No more condemnation in your life. Amen. He's the giver of every breath that I breathe. Author of all eternity, giver of every perfect thing, may you be the glory, maker of heaven and of earth, no one can comprehend your birth, king over all the universe, to you be the glory. Let's sing this part. I am alive because I'm alive in you. It's all because of Jesus I'm alive. It's all because the blood of Jesus Christ. It covers me and raises dead men's life. It's all because of Jesus I'm alive. Author of all eternity, giver of every perfect thing, to you be the glory, the maker of heaven and of earth. No one can comprehend your worth. I like this. King over all the universe, to you be the glory. I'm alive because I'm alive. Yeah. 
today. Amen. So glad he found me. Thank God, thank God, thank God.
just to praise Him. Hallelujah, we depend on Him today. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace.
let the words of my mouth, Lord, and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you. I will build my life. glad your hope is fixed on nothing less my hope is fixed on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but holy trust in Jesus name on Christ the Jesus in the day that we live in today. Amen. Let's give him one more applaud of praise. give you glory and we give you honor today. What an amazing God you are. Amazing presence of God. Lord, we know that we have a firm foundation that cannot be shaken. No matter the storm, the adversity, nothing because we're built upon the rock and that is Jesus Christ. I thank you today for it and I praise you for it in Jesus name. Amen, amen, amen. Give him one more hand clap of praise. He's worthy. Thank you, Jesus.
Yes, yes, yes. He is worthy of it all. Greet someone today. Before you're seated, look over at him, bump him and say, well, don't bump him too hard. Just say, hey, I'm glad you made it today. Glad you're here. You know, and mean it. Really mean it. Look over and wave at him and say, I am so, and if you don't know him, introduce yourself. Know their names, and it's so good to have you all here at Celebration Church today. Uh, I had to think about it. When you look outside, are we really in Bakersfield with this weather, right? The Lord just keeps giving us blessings upon blessings. This is very unusual weather. If you're watching from home, it's highly unusual, the cool weather we're having. Even in the 80s here to be in June is very unusual. And our little rain shower, well, it was a thunderstorm this last week. To Mark, I said, listen to that rain and listen to the thunder. That's, again, unusual for California this time of year. So I'm just loving it. It is wonderful. And I know most Californians are right now. And we're taking all the rain we can get. I know the farmers are needing some of the sunshine for their crops. So we just know God's going to balance it all out, right? And we trust him. He is a firm foundation. I love that one line of that song, and I will not be shaken. I remember when we were a little girl, we used, when I was a little girl, we would sing a hymn that I shall not be, I shall not be moved like a tree planted by the water. I had to think of that. I shall not be moved. And you know what? Those were songs that, man, it was like an anthem march, wasn't it? I think those songs, they made the devil mad. And today as we were singing that one line, I will not be shaken. That's what you were doing. You were just letting your enemy know, I've got a firm foundation and nothing is going to shake me. And so our kids, yes, the kids can go on out and uh, I'll be taking them out. I'm teaching today. And so thank you, Maddie, uh, for doing the music. And I've got the lesson and all the fun stuff uh, up here. And I'll be going out with the kids this week again. And so I love it. I love going out with our children. What better investment than for our future, right? And uh, so I love it. And uh, I want to say thank you to everyone yesterday, those that came out. For our father's family and friends lunch. It was a wonderful catered lunch from Brooklyn's. And Brooklyn's barbecue just went over the top again. And uh, they did amazing. And thank you uh, to those that stayed around, even the dads that stayed around and helped clean up, clear out, and uh, everything that needed to be done. And it was a wonderful celebration. All the gifts that we gave out and the prizes. Uh, it was fun. We love to give honor to the dads. You know what? We need to celebrate the good ones. Just don't look at the, the negative. There's a lot of good men and fathers out there trying their best to do their best, right? And we need to celebrate them and say thank you. And we will be doing that next Sunday is actually Father's Day. We had moved a couple months ago. We started announcing uh, the Father's Lunch was going to be moved up the, a week from when we normally have it. And that's because Pastor and I were going to be gone. And we wanted to be here for the Father's Lunch. So thank you to everyone yesterday that was here. But Pastor and I, we will be flying out to Tennessee, going to General Convention. And as you know, Pastor's family all live, uh, all nine kids except him and all their families live in the Nashville area. So at least once or twice a year, we try to duck in there into the Nashville area and see, say hi to everyone. And it's okay, you guys get to, a lot of you live here with family and those of you that go and see your family. So pastors have families too. And that's where Pastor's family is at. And uh, so we'll get to uh, duck in a couple of days and visit with family and then head on up to Gatlinburg for general convention. And, you know, pastor this year, it's kind of a big year for him. Uh, it is the 40th anniversary of uh, they give honor to those that have been 25 years ordained, 40 years ordained, 50 years ordained. Well, pastor is going to be one of those being honored 40 years ordained with the Pentecost Church of God. And uh, last time we were in Nashville, I just kind of brought it up to, he has, uh, there's four brothers and five sisters. And so I mentioned it to all nine kids, 
and some of them thought it'd be so great just to celebrate with their brother, their pastor, uh, you know. And so uh, several of them are getting hotel rooms, and they're going to trek up from Nashville up to Gatlinburg and be there, which, you know, we never get family with us to celebrate in ministry because California people back there are scared of coming out here. Let me tell you what, the same question every time we go back, when are y'all going to get out of there? You know, they just think, and I go, you know what, it's a mission field. And that's where God, I look, I always thought when I was a little girl, I'd be a missionary. Well, guess what? I'm in one of the biggest mission fields in the world, I believe, and that's the state of California. God planted me here knowing that he was going to need some missionaries that were going to stay in the field. And so that's why I, I try to preach that to the family. I don't think they buy it. Uh, but uh, we're going to be going there, and they're going to be celebrating. We also have Brother Tom Cooley is going to be, uh, the honor will be given him also, 40 years of being ordained with the Pentecostal Church of God. And so I know that you and Wanda and Teresa, some of us, you're, we're all going to be there. You and Mark at the same service, uh, they will be giving both of you honor for that. So I think that's great to have two ministers, pastors here in the church that they'll be giving honor at the general convention. They do the biannual convention there. And uh, I know so much planned that uh, it's almost mind-boggling all of the things. So there is no relaxation. If you say, go relax, have a good time, it is like hit the ground running and you are going. It'd be like you going on a seminar for your work. And uh, it's classes from early in the morning to late in the evening, dressed up, and you are going nonstop. So, uh, but it is business, and it is going to be work, as I know even pastor, uh, as bishop and everything, his meetings will begin, I think, one of them even this Friday. And so there's a lot going on there. But uh, just pray for us as we head out. Uh, next Sunday is Father's Day. And before he heads out, Brother Tom Cooley is going to be speaking next Sunday to on Father's Day. So I know you all will enjoy that. That's going to be a wonderful uh, time, I know. And you know what? This is always the question. Not always, but there's always a few questions. Well, if pastors are gone, are we still going to have church? Someone will send the message, is there still church this Sunday? Uh, Wednesday night, is, a bit, is there still going to be church Wednesday night? Let me tell you what, everything is taken care of. Get the word out. Just because pastors are gone doesn't mean the church doors are going to be closed. And you know what? Furthermore, if we both would go to heaven sometime this week or in the near future, let me tell you what, the church is still going to go on even though the pastors are gone, right? Because there's there's still a church. Every generation raises up a new church. And so there's church. Uh, I know Wednesday night we're going to have Orlin is going to be the adult teacher for the next two Wednesdays. Uh, Mitch, you're still going to have the youth out there the next two Wednesdays. Sister Sharon Tassie is going to teach the kids class for me the next two Wednesdays. So thank you, Sharon, for doing that uh, in advance in case I forget. So everything's it. Let's just give everyone a hand. Don't you love it? You know, it's like a dinner, and everybody just brings the right dish, and you're going, that's exactly what I wanted. That's what's needed. And uh, all working together, I know the music pastor has that all taken care of, and the worship, everything. So no questions. There will be church the next two weeks. And uh, we'll be back. Uh, just miss one Sunday, and we'll be back in two weeks. But next Sunday, uh, uh, we'll have gifts to hand out to all the dads and with Brother Cooley there. Uh, going to be teaching. We do want to let you know that camps are coming up and the end of that registration, we need them to register by this Friday. So what we have is we have registration forms and we need you to take those immediately following the service. They're out on the back table there. Fill those out. And since the, we did the fundraiser and we, all the kids that have raised the money and have participated in our Taco Tuesday fundraiser, all you have to do is fill that registration form out bring it back on Wednesday night and then sister Sharon will go down our church secretary even though we're gone she'll take those registrations with the church check-in to pay for all of the children uh, that participated in the taco Tuesday fundraiser send to camp does that sound okay I think it's great thank you to everybody that has bought tickets for that I know that some kids sold 13 tickets some sold 17 and some sold double of that 
And so all of the kids that have participated in our Taco Tuesday fundraiser, they're all going to camp. And uh, they're more than enough. Uh, we just need to get the registration forms and the church check paying for that. That was the best way than to do it individually per person. So if you can get the word out to your grand, I know it's a lot of grandkids uh, that had participated. Get that word out. And we want to make sure that they all attend that. And if you still want a Taco Tuesday, say, you know, nobody asked me uh, anything yet. I said that on Wednesday night and a grandma came up to me and she said, my granddaughter still needs some tickets. And I said, I'll buy seven of them. And uh, so you can do that and make sure you can see me, see our youth pastor, Pastor Mitch back there. I'm sure he knows some of the youth that still need to maybe sell a few of those. Is it okay if we just send all the kids up to camp? I, I think it's great. This is It's one of the greatest things really that we still uh, have here in our state and in our denomination is our youth camps. And uh, so we want to, <laughs> this morning of all things, she's probably watching the lady that does mine and Mark's hair. She's wanting to send her kids and she's sending her, she found out about the youth camp when you were getting your hair cut the other day. And so she's already registered her kids and her kids' friends. She texted me and said, it's already done. So, I mean, you have an influence. Let some know this is a good camp. The littles are only there for like three days and the, the older kids, I think, are there for four days. And so uh, it's a great time. Time, really, and the price is still a fantastic price. I've looked around at youth camps, any place, and it's still a great price. So we do want to make sure we send all the kids uh, there. Are all of our other announcements, you can go on our website. You can go on our Facebook. There's a lot of things that are happening. We have the prayer gathering. But I want to throw something out there that is not on any of our announcements yet. I was contacted this week, and I need your help. I committed to something before I really, I prayed about it, but when, then when they sent me the list of everything that needs to be done, I thought, wow, I'm going to need, especially the ladies of this church, to help me. Uh, how many of you know that we have supported the Bakersfield Pregnancy Center for probably 20 years? You all have been such a wonderful part of that. Uh, supporting it. Well, they're doing a ministry there now that the ladies that have decided to keep their babies, lots of times there are no families, there's nobody to throw a baby shower. The month of July, they have about 15 or 20 ladies that have decided to keep their babies, and there's no baby shower for these almost 20 ladies. Yeah, my heart went, because I know me, my daughter, we all gave baby showers. Families do that. But these Young people do not have that, and a lot of them are going to bring the dads of their babies, too. And so they ask, I don't know if it's because of the events we do at our church and what they see in our connection, but on July the 27th, they would like to have a baby shower in English and a baby shower in Spanish. And I immediately, they said, can Celebration Church do that? And I go, absolutely. We would love to do that. And uh, they said one starts at 4.30. One will start at 6.30, I think. And we need people that can do food, uh, snacks, do games. But here is the hitch when I said yes. I'm looking at Claudia and some of you that maybe speak Spanish. If you could help me. Uh, because some of these ladies that will be coming for the Spanish ones speak no English or very minimal. And I committed to something that I speak no Spanish. But I know we do have ladies in our church that do. And all I need you to do is, like, help them with the games and interact. Help me interact. So especially if you speak Spanish or know anyone that could help us with the ladies, uh, talk to me after church. Pray about it. Send me a text or a message. Uh, I know several of you I'm looking out that you say, I could do that. We can use your Spanish, and the Lord will minister to these. Is that okay if we do this in our community? I think it, life is always the best choice, right? There's no other choice to me, but the best is life. And so we want to celebrate with them. I've already got the theme and the decorations, but I just need especially the ladies that will help us and what will be going down and setting up and decorating their facility and throwing two baby showers, one in English, one in Spanish. That will be July the 27th. So I'll get the word out to Sharon, and I know she's probably already writing it down and uh, that date. But will you all kind of pray with us that, that the Lord, what they want us to do is even give a word in both. 
and uh, to encourage them and speak life for them, like a 15-minute little devotion uh, to them. And lots of times they are not married to the father of the baby, but the dads are going to be there too. So uh, we'll be giving gifts to the mothers, giving a gift maybe on parenting. I, I, I'm thinking just a good devotional Bible study or something for the men, these young boys, and something for the women too. Does that sound okay? And we need anything donated like that. So uh, stop praying about it. If you go, you know what, I can donate some prizes, or I can just give you cash to go get what you need. I want to decorate it. I want it to be wow. They've given their hearts to Jesus Christ. They've made the choice to keep their baby, and Celebration Church wants to connect with them through the pregnancies. I'm just blown by God doing this. If you don't know, it is like I was just all over it, and I thought, well, if no one else does it, I'm going to go out and do it on my own, but I know Celebration Church is going to be right there. Uh, by my side, and we will do it. Are you all going to help me and and pray about it and do? Uh, the men are raising their hands. Hey, that's great. I love it. We'll put the men to work. I think that's awesome. And uh, uh, the big thing is, if you speak Spanish, I do need help at that second baby shower. Is that okay? Are you all think that's fantastic? Uh, we're we're gearing up for camps. We've got going on our kids crusade coming up. We have the dates for that. It is the force, and uh, I've always wanted to do a Star Wars theme. Every year, I always say I've always wanted to do a circus. I've always wanted to do uh, Mario Brothers. Well, I've always wanted to do a Star Wars theme, and uh, so we're gonna do the force. There's the dates. Save them August fourth through six. And uh, we have a great time doing that, too. So make sure you save all of the dates. This is where uh, your time is to give back. Uh, You can do that in your tithe, in your offering, in your giving. There's several ways to do that. You can do the text to give. You can do online giving by mail. If you are here in person, we have the offering box there on the back wall. And uh, when you leave the service this morning, you can drop your offering, your tithe, whatever you would like to give into that. Uh, We didn't get to mention missions. And Pastor, you can come on up. Uh, we'll have him as he's here getting ready to deliver the word. Uh, Our missionaries that are over in Peru right now, uh, I know that there's a lot. We're reading what's going on in Peru and and some of the sickness and things that's happening there. And as I was watching the live videos that Mike and Taylor Yersick and little Lainey, you know, riding down the Amazon in these little chug boats, I call them something from a cartoon And uh, they're really doing amazing things. And then also with the new baby on the way, praying for God to protect it. Now in the midst of this, a little outbreak of a sickness going on in this uh, government or in the the country. And it's a national thing. Uh, Could you all stand up? I I believe we've, let's go ahead and stand up. We're going to do a special prayer. We've come in covenant with these missionaries. And I don't know, oh, there's their picture. There's Lainey. They're over to the right, the year six. And uh, it's amazing what they're doing and who they're reaching. And we have connected with them. I mean, they're a part of this church, part of our, our district, and they're out bringing the gospel to people that have never heard it. Uh, they, one gentleman is a pastor in one of the villages, and they took him into town, and uh, he wanted a guitar. And so the year six were able to buy him a guitar, and uh, he's already putting it to use and leading worship there. Isn't that amazing? I showed it to Pastor. I said, he's got your heart, that Pastor does, with the guitar. And uh, But so much happening. But we need to pray specifically uh, for whatever this virus sickness that is that's going around in uh, the country there of Peru. We need to pray for the baby that is uh, they will be having this fall. Uh, pray for little Lainey, mom and dad, just every, so much going on. But there's still people they need to reach in the next couple weeks. So let's be specific and know that God is going to do this. And let's just join forces right now. God, right now, we just trust you, Lord. God, Taylor and Micah have been sent. So many people you've given the call to, but they're disobedient and they don't go. But God, Taylor and Micah have said yes. They have forsook all and they've 
just to up their stakes and took their baby with them and a new baby on the way. And God, we know the devil's mad trying to stop everything in that country, uh, that nation. And God, we just speak that a covering of healing right now goes across Peru right now. Every sickness, every disease, let the blood of Jesus be applied right now to that country of Peru. And God, I pray right now that a revival, an awakening, and a shaking is happening, God, as they are on the front lines right now, this young couple and little Laney with them, God, as they are getting on boats going down the Amazon, as they're going into places that they've never even seen light-skinned people, where they've never heard the gospel. They are being first-timers going in and presenting the gospel. Lord, they're a mighty force, and it's not them. It's God in them. Lord, you're going before them. Prepare the path, God. Remove all hindrances, every attack of the enemy right now. Thwart every plan that the enemy is trying to do right now. In the name of Jesus, and let the word of God go forth, powerful and mighty, to save God. And I thank you for it. God, bless this little family, now of four, that's going to be coming, Lord, soon. Bless them abundantly. Give them their heart's desire, and that is souls. Give them many souls for the kingdom, not for them, but for the kingdom business at hand. I thank you, God, while young people are, are fleeing and not doing things. This is a young couple that has stepped up and said, we will. Bless them, God. And we thank you, God. Be a hedge about them. Be a hedge about them right now. Cover them. Cover them. Cover little Laney right now, I pray. God, I don't know why I'm dwelling on this. Maybe there's a need right now where they're at. But Holy Spirit, be a covering around little Laney right now and mom and dad. And we plead the blood of Jesus over them. And I thank you for it. God, in Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And last week was Missions uh, Sunday. Yes. And uh, we just did not get an opportunity to remind you of that. And uh, so make sure that you tuck in a little extra in your giving this week, all right, for missions. And we have commitments to our missionaries, not just to your six, but before you're seated this morning, find three or four people and say, I'm sure glad to see you today. All right? Come on now. You just get a double portion. Kim said Someone. she just did that, but that's all right. Someone else. Someone else. And you can be seated. I want Kim to help me sing a little song that's been on my heart. It used to be when I was sinning, Satan stood out somewhere grinning at the pleasures of the world that turned on. Drops came like a rain were falling till I heard my Savior calling. If you can't go on anymore, just lean on me. Now I won't walk without Jesus. I won't talk without Jesus. I been regretting like no other man he could not stroll on down the street oh but peter and john they passed by his way look upon us peter did say rise up and walk in the name of the lord and that man leaped to his feet and he said i won't 
unrehearsed. <laughs> I'm not singing years and years, amen, but I enjoyed that. I love that. Some of the old songs are great songs, right? Yes. How many of you determined in your heart you're not going to walk without Jesus? Amen. Well, I've heard Kim say many times that everybody has a story. And, uh, and she talks about times growing up in church that, that we had testimony time. And some of those times, you know, became uh, oh me times uh, in years past, but there was still something to those those times where we shared testimonies. And um, I was talking to Don Anderson this morning, and they've been out for a while because Joanne had surgery and, and so forth, and he was giving me a great report. Come on up here, Don, just briefly. Just just give an update and, and tell what you told me about how good... Uh, uh, Joanne's doing all right. Well, God is so good. Um, you may not, or you may be aware that Joanne had knee replacement surgery two weeks ago this past surgery, this past Thursday, rather. And this past week, we went in to see the surgeon to get a progress report, and the report was fantastic. The surgeon reported that she was in the top 1% of those in, in terms of the progress of her healing for her knee and and that also she was as far along after it hadn't even been two weeks by that point as most folks are three months after a similar surgery a knee replacement surgery so we know that the church has been praying for us and we thank you for those prayers and we give all the glory to Jesus, all the glory to God, because he is so good all the time, isn't he? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Don. How many think testimonies are still good? Amen. Maybe we need to start having some more of those on Sunday morning and Wednesday night. Amen. Uh, especially when you hear a good one like that. That's just like the Lord. I want to get into our message this morning. I'm I'm looking at, in fact, I'm anticipating, I'm sorry that I have to be gone next week um, in hearing Brother Tom preach. Uh, I'm anticipating the, the good report of Father's Day, and uh, it's going to be a, a great time. I want to preach this morning for just a, a little bit, depending on as the Lord leads, on this thought, facing the giants in your life. Facing the giants in your life. So we'll go to 1 Samuel chapter 17. You may be sitting here thinking, well, Pastor, I really don't have any uh, giants in my life. You will. You will, man. We've all encountered them from time to time. Man, they may not be there today, but they will be a man in some form. And uh, so I want, to, I want us to look at this text this morning. David said to the Philistine, talking about Goliath, You come against me with the sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you 
in the name of the Lord Almighty. You know, that's always a good idea to come in the name of the Lord. In fact, if we don't, we don't really have any authority or any power. So he says, I come against you in the name of the Lord. And then listen, the Lord, all, the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, who you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Wow, that sounds like he's pretty serious, doesn't he? I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world. The whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. The whole world will know. Wow, that's quite a statement. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's. I've got to say that again. For the battle is the Lord's. Say it with me one time. For the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you, give all of you into our hands. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word today. Now most of us remember the story of David and his giant Goliath, don't we? Although this was probably the, the, the memorable of the hero stories of King David, the most memorable I should say, it was not the only giant that David ever faced before or after. Say, I don't remember reading of another giant. Well, you'll find out that giants come in all sorts of ways, all sorts of shapes, all sorts of sizes, all sorts of different names. Goliath stares down from the hillside, and only disbelief keeps him laughing at the sight of David. For compared to his nine and a half foot frame, Wearing 125 pounds of armor, his biceps bursting and muscles ripple as his boast belts down through the canyon at the Valley of Elah. He says, this day I defy the ranks of Israel. This day I defy the ranks of Israel. And then he says, give me a man and let us fight each other. Send me your champion, and we will do battle. And if I have the victory, then Israel will serve the Philistines. But if he has the victory, then the Philistines will serve Israel. And it's no wonder to me, with this picture that I just painted to you, that no one volunteered when Goliath proposed his challenge. In fact, when you read the story in 1 Samuel chapter 17, you will find that not only David's older brothers that had been considered by Samuel to be the next king of Israel. Remember when Samuel went down to the house of Jesse and he walks by Eliab and Abinadab and, and, the, and the older brothers of, of uh, David and the Lord says, hold on, these are not the ones those that Samuel probably at first thought was the ones because of their stature and the fact that they were already military men, God says uh, they're not the ones, and they certainly were not the ones, because according to the Scripture, when you look at it, it says that they quivered and trembled with fear. And not only did David's older brothers tremble, but the king of Israel, Saul, who the Bible says stood head and shoulders over the other men of Israel. I mean, his stature was great. He was a king that God not necessarily chose, the people chose, but God laid his hand upon him and anointed him and touched a band of men to follow him. And, and uh, these brothers of David and Saul wanted to climb under a rock somewhere at the threatening of this nine and a half foot 
Philistine. Someone that David uh, says, you have blasphemed God. You have blasphemed the armies of Israel. And when David shows up that morning from tending sheep, we have to understand, first of all, he's not very old. He doesn't have a lot of time behind him other than in tending sheep. And he makes his first decision. His decision is to take his staff in his hand and he chooses five smooth stones from the brook nearby and puts them in his shepherd's bag. With sling in his hand, he goes across the valley of Elah and he approaches his giant. Get that picture in your mind today, if you will. Goliath, he says to him, he scoffs and he says, you come to me with sticks. David versus Goliath is like a toothpick versus a tornado. Like a toy poodle versus a giant Rottweiler. That's the way that picture was that day. And if you didn't already know the story, what odds would you give David against his giant? Probably not much. You see, we have, the, uh, we have the luxury, we have the privilege of reading the end of the book. We have read the end of every one of these stories in the Bible. But when you're living through these stories, like we are today, amen, then you would probably look and say, man, uh, better odds perhaps than, than uh, you know, Better odds with David's story or David's picture, uh, perhaps, than we give ourselves against our giants sometimes. Think about that. He said, you, you, you see your Goliath today, and I, I, I want to paint this picture in your mind. We all have our Goliaths from time to time. Maybe some of you are dealing with a giant in your life right now. Some have dealt with your giant for years. And your giant doesn't carry a sword and doesn't carry a shield, doesn't carry a javelin, but rather he brandishes other blades in front of us. Unemployment, abandonment, abuse, depression, divorce, difficulty, death. Your giant doesn't parade up and down the hills of Elah, but rather he prances through your office or your living room or your bedroom or your classroom or your workplace. He brings things like bills that you can't pay, grades that you can't make, people that you cannot control and those that you could never please, alcohol that you cannot resist, pornography that you can't refuse, a dead-end career that you can't escape, a past and guilt and condemnation that you can't seem to shake, and a future that you can't face. One thing for sure, you know well the voice of your giant, One thing for sure, you know the roar of his words. One thing for sure, you know the threatenings and the scoffing that you have heard over and over again throughout the days of your life. Again, some for a little while, some for many years. So today, I want us to consider our giants in the light of David's. Because there are many similarities in your giants, and my giants, and David's giant. And we're going to discuss some of the giants that David had faced before he ever encountered Goliath. And some of the giants that he had to do battle with even after he killed Goliath and took his head, as he said that he would. David faced a giant who challenged him, first of all, the scripture says, morning and night. Think about that. Every morning, Goliath stands, nine and a half feet tall, his voice booming, 
carrying and echoing across that valley. Send me a man. Send me your champion. And then in the evening, as if they thought that it would go away and give them a break for at least a 24-hour period, and yet it doesn't go away. Day and night, the giant steps out and begins to thunder threatenings and accusations, just like our enemy does. Yours does the same, day and night, day after day after day, month after month. The first thought of the morning and the last worry at night is, the, is what your giant has been saying to you or putting against you. Your giant wants to dominate your day. He wants to dominate your night. He wants to infiltrate your joy awaiting in the morning and tormenting at night. Doesn't that sound like the enemy? The Bible says fear brings torment. I remember when we were going through a very difficult time. I've shared this testimony before. And, uh, uh, you know, our, our son, which I, uh, Scotty went through 15 years or more, 15 years after we found out what was going on. Sometimes things are happening that you just don't know, right? And, uh, and yesterday he was here at our Father's Day luncheon, and, I, and, and it, it just blesses me to be in his presence now. I mean, stood at my truck, and three times before he let me go, he told me he, he loved me. And uh, you know what? It's amazing to see what God can do with a lie. But I want to tell you, it wasn't always easy, right? So I remember that classic night, usually on a Saturday night, because that always happens in a preacher's life, you know, getting ready to do church the next morning, and Saturday night, a difficult night, and I was up, could not sleep, I was consumed with worry, didn't know where he had been. How many have ever been there before? And the voice of the Holy Spirit spoke to me as clearly as I have ever heard God speak to me. And the Holy Spirit said, you can't sleep, huh? And I said, no, Lord, you know the, the worry that I'm, that I'm uh, just, just engrossed in. And he said to me, you know, that's funny. Have you ever read that I don't slumber and I don't sleep? And I said, yes, Lord, I, I've read that. And he said, well, don't you think that I've got this? And if I don't slumber and I don't sleep and I've take, taken care of this for you, then what are you doing awake worrying? And then he takes me to a psalm that says that he gives his beloved rest or sleep. I want to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. God is always on time in the midst of those things, but I have had those tormenting times. I've heard that other voice in my ear that said, you know what, I'm going to kill him and then let's see what becomes of things. I want to tell you something today. Your giant will try to dominate your day and dominate your night, will infiltrate your life, steal your joy, await you in the morning, torment you at night, Listen, Goliath's family was an ancient foe of David's. He was an ancient, his family was an ancient foe of the nations. And I can tell you that your giant didn't just crop up someday. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. You will endure trouble. He told his disciples, you will be hated by the world, and not because of you. You will be hated because you belong to me, and the world hates me. The scripture says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Have you ever read that scripture? And so it did not just happen overnight, but these things, listen, this giant was an ancient foe. The families of these giants, the ancestors of these giants were ancient foes to David's family ancient foes to David's people, ancient foes to David's nation or, or, or the, the families in the nation because Joshua had drove them out of Canaan 300 years before except for three cities, Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod, 
And according to Scripture, Goliath was from Gath. I don't know why Joshua didn't take the bull by the horns and do what God had totally commanded him. He said, I want you to drive the giants out. I want you to obliterate them. I want you to not let their seed go, go on. I don't know why that happened. But you see, somewhere down the way, maybe back in your past or your history, or an ancestor, a grandfather, grandmother, great-grandfather, grandmother, we seem to always find a way or a loophole to blame what went on generations before. And many times that's the same. But we'll say, you know what? It, but my father faced the same thing. My, because my dad was an alcoholic, it's just, it's just predisposed to me that I'm, that, that I'm going to be an alcoholic. Or, or because uh, my parents went through a divorce or my mother or my father faced that rejection, I'm going to have the similar thing. Standing is your giant like the long-standing bully in your valley. Oh, come on, somebody. When Saul's intimidated soldiers saw Goliath, they must have mumbled to themselves, not again. My dad fought this giant. My grandfather, my grandmother, my great uncle, my granddad fought his granddad. Not again. And you've grown something similar along the way yourselves from time to time. I've had people say, Pastor, that has followed me throughout my life. I just can't seem to shake it. Or you know what? I thought I had that under control. And it just crept up again in a time of my weakness or maybe in the time of your success because then you get a little lax and complacent after spiritual victories in our life. Sometimes that's when we encounter those giants again. I'm just saying... Yours may be different than mine. The writer of Hebrews says in the 12th chapter that we are to lay aside the weight, first of all, not the weight of sin. Sin can become a weight, but he says lay aside the weight and the sin that does so easily beset you. In other words, you've got to remove all the encumbrances in your life if you are going to run the race that is set before you with patience or endurance. And along the way, look unto Jesus because he is the author and he is the perfecter of your faith. And so here is this giant. He's the bully in your valley. He's the one that keeps you awake at night and the one that you wake up to worry in the morning. And so when Saul and the army of Israel heard his challenge, they were terrified. In fact, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 11 in the, in the message translation this is what it says. It says, when Saul and his troops heard the Philistines' challenge, that they were terrified, and watch this, they lost all hope. Hope was gone. Ever been there? Where you said, you know what? I I'm never going to get through this. This is just getting worse. I want to tell you something. Sometimes you face those giants, and before it gets better, it gets worse. Or you think it gets worse. God is already moving in your situation. You just don't realize it yet because we're seeing through eyes of flesh and not spiritual eyes. And we have to believe. Paul says, for we know that all things work together for the good of, of those who love the Lord and to the called according to his purpose. And I like to say this, if you don't know, if you don't believe it, we need to know, we need to believe that all things work together for good to those who love God and to the called according to his purpose. When Saul and his army heard his challenge, they were terrified, they had lost all hope, and here comes a shepherd boy on the scene, one that has the handprint of God on his life, one that later, when he's dealing with a similar struggle at, at, at the house of Nabal, and, and, and Nabal has given him a, an, a, 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 an insult almost beyond forgiveness, and Abigail, Nabal's wife, comes out and she says to him, listen, you don't want to do this thing. You don't want to commit murder here at, Abel, at Nabal's house today because you are bound in the bundle of life. Or in other words, God has had a plan on your life before Samuel ever came down to the house and anointed you to be king. 
God had his handprint on your life when you were out there in the midst of the old stinking smelly sheep and none of your brothers wanted to do the job and it was handed down to the baby brother because you were the less one in the line of succession. But God had his hand upon your life. He had destiny upon you. He had purpose upon you. And you are bound in the bundle of life. This guy Nabal, he's a fool. He doesn't have a future. But you're going to be the king someday. And you don't want anything to to prevent what God has in store for you in your future as you carry forth the destiny of God in your life. Oh, that giant that you face will try to tell you that you won't have future and that that there is no hope for you, that what God has promised you that he has forgotten about or maybe you just dreamed it somehow and and you never really uh, understood it uh, you, you just somehow you just conjured it up in your mind and your emotions. Now you know your giant. Listen, nobody knows like I know those things that we deal with. You know your giant. Your giant may not be mine, as I said before, but you know your giant. You know his walk. You know his talk. Is he all that you see? You know his voice. But is that all you hear? You see, David saw and he heard more. And here's we want to turn the corner here. And, and I, could, I could be up here all day and describe the thing. And you'd shake your head and you'd say, yeah, pastor, I've faced similar things before. But I want to show you some help along the way. Because David did not show up discussing the giant. David showed up discussing his God. Now, that's the key. You need to hear that today. He didn't dwell on the height of Goliath. He didn't dwell on the depth of his voice. He didn't dwell on the things that hurt his feelings that Goliath may have said about him when he said, am I a dog that they would just send a boy to me? You come to me with just a stick. Amen. Really, the truth of the matter, David wasn't coming with just a stick. He was coming in the name of the Lord God of all of the angel armies and all of the Israel armies, the Lord God Almighty. But you see, in this, we know those words, we know his talk, we know his walk, we know his voice, but that's not all that we need to hear. David shows up not discussing Goliath. David shows up discussing God Almighty. Read the first words that he spoke. Get into this story, and as you read the story, you would think that David would say, oh man, uh, you know what, this guy's big, or oh man, this guy's strong, or oh man, this guy's scary, or oh man, this guy is, is impossible to beat. But you know what, the very first words in the story in, in, uh, in Samuel 17, verse 26 here, the very first words that David spoke He asked this question, what will be done for the man who kills the Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Now, maybe we wouldn't have done that. We would have said, man, how am I ever going to do this? God has asked me, I feel this unction in my heart, but how am I ever going to do it? No, David walks up. No wonder his brother may have thought that he was a a smart aleck because he said, what's going to be done for the man who kills this dude? What is the one that removes the disgrace from Israel and kills the giant? What are they going to get out of the thing? And of course, I don't, you know, maybe David should have thought twice before he asked that because he got Saul's daughter as his wife, and that didn't turn out too good, did it? The soldiers never mentioned anything about God. Read the story. His brothers never spoke the name of Yahweh or the name of Jehovah, the name of El Shaddai, the provider, or Elohim, the God that is everywhere and more than is needed, or El Elyon, the God who is all-powerful. They never spoke his name, but David arrives and the very first one that he brings up is God and does the same with King Saul. This is what he says to Saul. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistines. 
little sister Shirley Jones, who we had here over the years preaching revival, she said, instead of reminding your God how big your problem is, why don't you remind your problem how big God is? We show up with His name on our list. Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are lovely, if there is any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, then think on these things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus who loved me and gave himself for me. Think upon those things. Begin to rehearse those things in your mind. If you have lack at your house, then begin to think, my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. If those kids that you've been praying for are getting honorier by the day and more unruly, then begin to rehearse the word of God that says, me and my household, you and your entire household shall be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. When you've got problems that you're facing, when you've got things that are coming undone, begin to talk about the things of God, that we are above only and not beneath, the head and not the tail, blessed coming in and going out. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Why? Because he's paid a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He's anointed my head with oil, and my cup is running over. You see, I could think of those things just off the top of my head in the last few seconds. Begin to Think about how good God has been and how big God is and how small, how tiny that giant in your life is compared with the great almighty God who gives favor, who is just, who is gracious, who is kind, who is loving. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. David shows up discussing God. Wow. Wow. I come to you in the name of the Lord. No one, else, no one else even mentions God. David mentions no, nothing else or no one else but God. Do you see that? Here's the subplot. There is a subplot to this story. The plot really is not David versus Goliath. Do you see that? But this is the subplot. It's giant focus versus God focus. Now, David's predecessors had the same problem when they went in to, to, to possess the land of Israel or the land of Canaan. And this is what they did. Twelve of them went in and they saw what? They saw giants. They saw the land was fortified. They saw the cities were fortified. They saw the giants. And this is what they did. Now, watch this. They said, because we have seen ourselves as grasshoppers in our own sight, right? Then the people of the land saw us as grasshoppers in their sight. So the subplot, it's really not David versus Goliath. It is being God-focused versus being giant-focused. Right? Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in that law doth he meditate. When? Day and night. Listen, that giant torments you day and night, meditate in the law of God day and night. And he shall be like a tree that is planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth its fruit in its season. And its leaf also shall not wither, and everything, all that he or she does shall prosper. Amen. I'm talking about my Jesus. I'm talking about his plan for me. I'm talking about the ways and the means of God Almighty and His love for me, and His love for you, and His blessing in our lives. Amen. But we've got to get our focus off of the things. We have to remove our focus from the circumstance and the problems 
and not be in, inner focused, but be God focused. Amen. And as we look beyond those inner things and begin to look to God, no wonder that writer of Hebrews says, look to Jesus. And when you break down that verse of Scripture in its original language, this is what it's really saying to us. Not just keep your eyes on Jesus, but get your eyes off of anything else but Jesus. Take it off of all the other things that would try to to captivate your time and your thoughts uh, in the race. Uh, put your eyes on Jesus and take your eyes off of anything else. Don't be giant-focused, but be God-focused. Amen. I'm feeling my Holy Ghost about now. Amen. So here we go. Here is the plot that thickens. All eyes but David's are on the giant. David's eyes are on the Lord. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. He sees the giant. No denial there. And people say, man, pastor, I'm struggling. I can't. It's denial to say anything else. No, we're not. I'm not asking you to deny anything. You're in a problem. Don't say that you're not. Jesus said, when you come to the mountain, say to the mountain. He didn't say, don't, he didn't say, say mountain, you're not there. He said, speak to the mountain. Say to the mountain. Be cast into the sea. And if you do not doubt it in your heart, your faith will move mountains. Amen. Pastor, I just don't want to be in denial. Have you ever heard Jesus Say, with God all things are impossible. Listen, acknowledge the problem. Don't be in denial. Square off against that giant. Look him in the eye, but make sure that your eyes are on the Lord. He sees the giant uh, probably in his peripheral vision, if truth is known, but it, the fact is that he just sees God more. And so what happens? Saul and the brothers are afraid. David rushes his giant, but he does so with a God-saturated soul. Let me talk to you about a God-saturated soul for just a few minutes. It appears that David is rushing out to sudden death. The Bible shows him running across the valley of Elah, out to meet the giant. While the armies are covering their eyes, they can't watch. When's the last time that we did the same? Instead of shrinking, run to meet it with a God inspiration and a God drive and a security in our soul that has been saturated by God. Hallelujah. When's the last time that we did that? Instead of running, I heard a preacher say one time, the only part of the armor of God is illustrated in Ephesians 6. The only part that is missing is a back plate. But God just knows that his soldiers never retreat. We don't need a back plate. We need a breastplate. Amen. The breastplate of righteousness. Here's David is rushing out to sudden death. How long since you ran out to meet that challenge? And didn't shrink, didn't get depressed, didn't run. Oh, we just we, we just have to we, we have to get away. You know, I'm not telling you not 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 to go places and do things, but don't run from the challenge. Stand up, square your shoulders, look to the hills from where comes your help. Amen. Your help doesn't come from Marriott or Sheraton or Hilton. Amen? It comes from the Lord. Now, sometimes that's appropriate, but your help comes from the Lord. Your, your help doesn't come from Calgon. Amen? Take me away. Give me just some relief. Let me shut the door behind me and forget about this for the next few minutes or the next few days, but you know what? A few days later, the problem has not gone away. In fact, most of the time, it has become worse. Wow. We tend to retreat. 
duck behind the desk at work, crawl into a nightclub somewhere. Now, I know maybe many, not many here this morning do that, but there are some that do that. Maybe someone watching out on, on social media, that's your place to run and hide. Amen. Through the, 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 the party or the, the, the social life. Or we get distracted uh, by some sort of forbidden relationship. Or at, at first we feel we're safe but, or, or we're insulated or we're anesthetized. But when the work r- runs out, when the alcohol wears off, when the lover leaves, we hear our Goliath again and again. Well, I'm preaching now. Don't get too quiet on me. But you see, try a different strategy. Rush out and meet your giant. Amen. You come to me with the sword and spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. I was just sharing yesterday The book of Jude says that when Michael contended with Satan over the body of Moses, that he didn't shout railing accusations at him, but it says he said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. You know what? You have authority, and we have power. Not because of who we are, but because of who he is. The battle is the Lord's. Amen. We're going to tie this all up together here in just a minute, but But form a different strategy. You have a giant in your home, a giant on your workplace, a giant that you're facing. Depression, it may take, you may think this is going to take a lifetime, but I want to tell you something. Have this attitude, I'm not going to let this thing conquer me. I'm going to be the conqueror. I'm not going to let abuse, bigotry, insecurity, In fact, look at your giant and say, you're going down. You're going down in Jesus' name. You cannot stand against the Lord of the angel armies. You're going down. Amen. How long since you've loaded your sling and took a good swing of that sling at your giant? Too long? David's the model, but David is a man after God's own heart. But I want you to know this. Don't feel bad if there's been weakness from time to time because David was not a natural-born giant killer. He just wasn't, and we're not either. Our success is in him. Amen? Our success is in God. So watch David. David. David fell as often as he stood. He's said by theologians to be the greatest saint and yet the greatest sinner in the Bible. He was not a Joseph. You could say Joseph was the greatest saint, but David was not a Joseph. He was the greatest saint and he was the greatest sinner as well. David stumbled as often as he conquered. He defied God mockers in the valley, and yet he joined the God mockers in the wilderness. Think about what I'm saying. He stared down Goliath, and yet later, after he conquered that Goliath, he ogled at Bathsheba. True? He led armies and couldn't lead his family. Hello? It's true. The fact that God saw him as a man after his own heart should give every single one of us hope in our hour of weakness. Because it was it 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 was those difficult times that we face. It it probably came out of some of that difficulty that David said, The Lord is my shepherd. It wasn't before his tragedy, it was after his tragedy. If you follow that as close as we can chronologically, probably the most rehearsed psalm in the Bible out of 150 psalms, we quote that one probably the most. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
I shall not lack for anything. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. Amen. He leads me beside the still waters for his name's sake. Right? All of these things that David, that, that David found to be a reality were not necessarily through his successes, but he found those realities through some of his failures. And we allow the enemy to put his foot on our neck and hold us down in condemnation and fear and guilt and past mistakes. The fact is that God saw David as the apple of his eye and the man after his own heart should let you and I know in his good moments there was none better. In his bad moments, there was none worse. I'm just saying, man, might as well call it like it is. Take heart. Don't give up. Don't give in. This is another day. Face that day. No fear. No guilt. No shame. No condemnation. Hallelujah. Get it under the blood. The enemy is the accuser of the brethren. As if we think sometimes that we don't have anything for him to accuse us of. But I'm just glad that everything that he has to accuse me of has been washed in the blood a long time ago. And if I make a new mistake today, you know what, Brother Ron? The Bible says that I have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus the Righteous. And if I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive me of that sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. That ought to make somebody shout in the house today. Amen? So here we are. Here we are. Take heart, don't give in. We must face our giants, but we need not face them alone. David made two statements about Goliath. And he made nine statements about God. You missed that. I said David made only two statements about Goliath. And he made nine statements about God. Are you four times as likely to describe the strength of God as the strength of your giant in the demands of your day? All this has been a horrible day. Really? Really? Yeah, it may have been a horrible day. I have some of those days that I can't wait to get out of. But are you four times as likely to state how good God is as you are how bad your day is? How bad your circumstances are? Amen? Nine statements about God. Do you ponder God's grace? Every day throughout the waking moments of your day? Do you just from time to time say, Lord, I just want to thank you right now that your tender mercies and your loving kindnesses are new every morning. And so that means that when I got up this morning and said, good morning, Lord, that your loving kindnesses and your tender mercies were there to meet me. I want to just thank you that you are, are gracious and you are kind. I want to thank you that 142 times in the Psalms alone you said, or you said through your word that your mercies endure forever. I want to thank you today. Lord, I'm going to talk about you. My statements about you will be four times more than they are about how bad my day is or how big my problem is. Right. Wow. Lift your head up, you giant slayer. I want to I want to I want to talk about something else here. And I'm going to fit this in really quick. David said, "The Lord that delivered me from the paw of the lion and the bear will deliver me." You see, that was a lion, that was a bear. They didn't look like Goliath, but they were a giant that David faced. 
Now, Goliath was probably his most formidable foe. Probably you'd say this is the big one. This is the king or the granddaddy of all demons here. And I believe that, that we face those things from time to time. Amen? I'm not discounting the fact that, that new levels, new devils that we face. But I want to tell you, David, before he ever faced a giant, he had to get authority over control over a bear and a lion. The bear, you could say, was, was the beast of the flesh. Some of us want to have control over the devil when we don't even have control over our own flesh. Come on, somebody. The lion, you could say, was the beast of the world. Jesus said, love not the world, neither the things of the world, for the things of the world are passing away. David had to defeat the flesh and he had to defeat worldliness before he was ever qualified to go down and face a nine and a half foot giant. Uh Uh-oh, getting quiet now. We start talking about the flesh and the world. These are the things that are abominations to God. No, the seven things that God hates. Amen. And you realize that every one of those things have to do with the flesh. When you look at at the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, and it says it's love and joy and peace and gentleness and meekness and long-suffering and temperance and those things, you notice that those aren't our fruit, they're the Spirit's fruit, as long as the Spirit resides in us, that it should be very easy as we surrender our will to the will of God for the Spirit to produce those things in us. And every single one of those things in the Spirit look like Christ. When we let the Spirit have His way in our life, then He causes us to look more like Jesus every day in the things that we do and the, the things that we say. That's all I'm going to say about that. I could, I could camp out there a little while. But you know what? Galatians, right there around that, he said, and these are the works of the flesh. Every one of them works of the flesh. But you know what? If the Spirit looks like Jesus, then the flesh looks like Satan. Come on. It looks like the flesh. The Bible says about him that he was a liar and a liar from the beginning. That's the same thing that the flesh does. Amen. And so can I tell you, you have to get the victory over the flesh. You have to get the victory over the world. I've heard, in fact, one of the great things that my wife has said that I thought, you know what, I'm going to use that, and I am using it this morning. That She said there's a lot of people out there that are, that, are, that are trying to take authority over things when they need to get under authority first. Submit yourself, therefore, unto God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's what the Lord wants us to do, is the devil to have to flee from us, right? So we we resist him, and he flees, but not before we submit ourselves to God. Now, I'm not saying there are people that don't do that, but what I'm telling you, the reason that some of us have a difficult time from time to time facing our giants is because we're still facing the flesh. And we will until we're raptured. Amen. The flesh will come back because Paul says there's two things that are warring inside of us and it is the spirit and the flesh. And again, don't get all condemned or all hurt or all those things because God is not condemning you. Get those things under the blood. But we have to take control. We have to take authority over the flesh and over the, over the world before we can take authority over the devil. Amen? I'm sorry, I just couldn't leave that out. That just came to me as I'm preaching this morning. So in David's eyes, the giant was no problem. God delivered me from the paw of the bear and the paw of the lion. He he viewed his giant problem through faith, hear this, and not fear. Israel failed because they viewed the giants through their own eyes. Amen? Amen? But David did not view the giant through his own eyes. Amen. 
He faced the giant with faith and not fear. Jeff, if you will go ahead and come, brother, I'm done. So today we lift up our heads. We're not natural born giant slayers because in the flesh we were not. But in the spirit we are. Amen? Amen? I said in the spirit we are. I can do all things through Christ. I worship Him. But we've got to get our focus. You know what? I think that that, I'm just going to confess today. Stand with me. I think confession is good for the souls. There's been so many times I've had my focus on the sickness and not the healer. Amen? So many times I've had my focus on the problem and not the solver. Amen? So many times. Maybe some of you haven't, but I have. But today, I want to take my focus. You say, but pastor, man, you know what? When I have a symptom or something in, in, in me, I don't say, oh man, that symptom's not there. If it gets bad enough, I'm going to go do something about it. But I am not going to dwell on that as much as I am my healer. Not the formula, it's my Savior. Amen? Your giants have to fall. Your giants have to fall. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. It may be a process, but they have to fall. Kim and I have faced so many things, and I know you have. Our stories change. But the giants are real. But I want to declare to you today that when you say the battle is not mine the battle is not mine the battle is the Lord's Amen How many will declare that in faith today? How many will lift up your hand and say Oh thank you Jesus the battle is not mine Come on, just lift up your hand to Jesus. The battle's not mine. It's not that person I'm having a difficulty with. It's a giant. It's not that child of mine. It's that giant that opposes me. The battle is not mine. The battle is the Lord. God, right now in Jesus' name, we come against the flesh and we come against God the things that will cause us to not surrender and submit our lives to you and we bring ourselves under the covering we bring ourselves into submission not to a man or a woman but to the Lordship of Jesus Christ And as we bow before you, Lord, today, we know that you said that you would fight our battles. In fact, David said, I will always put the Lord before me. Lord, we put you before us. And as long as you're leading the way, we don't have a problem. Lord, because you don't have any problem. The battle is the Lord's. We declare it over our house. We declare it over our child, our children. We declare it over our spouse. We declare it over our family. We declare it over that person that we have a hard time with. We declare it, God. No, we declare that over ourselves because we have to get over that, God, before you ever will change the person that is deal- we're dealing with. God, we declare that over our lives. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let me ask you a question. How many believe that your giants have to die? Come on, wave at me. We used to sing a song around here. It says, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Amen. Giants die. 
How many are going to wave at me and say, you know what, in Jesus' name, Pastor. In Jesus' name. I want you to think about that giant you may be facing today. But don't think about it very long. Now begin to think how big God is. How mighty God is to save. How big He is to deliver. How great God He is. How powerful He is. How strong He is. How wonderful He is. How marvelous He is. Hallelujah. Father, I pray for these today. There are some that are facing difficulties like they've never faced before. God, it was just a few months ago that I faced a giant that I'd never had to face down in my entire life. But God, you gave strength and you give the victory every time. And so, Lord, I know that if you brought me through, God, that you'll bring these through. If you brought me through before, you'll do it again. Over and over and over and over. It doesn't matter the generations, the times, the decade or the years. You are timeless. You're all sufficient. We speak Jesus. Hallelujah. Now we give you the praise and the honor and the glory for the victory today. In Jesus' name. Everybody say, in Jesus' name. Come on, take your authority. Take your rightful authority. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. In the name of the Lord, God Almighty, who you blaspheme and who you defy this very day. Hallelujah. I will kill you and I will take off your head, David said. And I'll feed the flesh of the Philistine army and their carcasses to the fowls of the air. Boy, that's some attitude. Let's get some attitude today. Hallelujah. Not my job. Not my child. Not my marriage. Hallelujah. Not my home. Not my prosperity. Hallelujah. Not my health. Glory in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Brother Eli, that giant has to fall. Amen. You know his voice. You recognize it. But he has to fall. In Jesus' name. How many believe it? Glory. Let's sing this song together. We'll turn your eyes. In His wonderful face And the things of earth Shall grow strange Be dim in the light Of His glory will turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things, that's what needs to happen, the things of earth grow strangely dim. Light of his glory and grace. So I see that light. It may be the only thing that you see at the end of that journey, but keep your eyes fixed on him. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you. Be gracious unto you. Give you peace. Receive that in Jesus' name. Say amen. Praise God. You may be dismissed. Love you all.